to make a transition from uh, from the previous presentation. Um, I actually I was listening to the talk. I was wondering about the uh, the curriculum of, of teaching classics uh, at that time. So would have been very interested to dig into these notebooks and find kind of quotations of classical authors or uh, even to discover what texts they were read. Um, so this will be uh, the, the topic of, of my talk, uh, citation detection. Um, and I'll be presenting um, the pipeline, but most importantly, its applications, a pipeline that I've been developing over, over the past years. Um, so the outline for today, I will start a bit with a bigger picture uh, to give you an idea of why I think we should um, extract this type of the canonical references to classical authors and how it fits into a bigger context. Uh, I will be quite brief about the technology, uh, just to give a hint of uh, how it is working, but not go into details. And I will focus more on some applications that this pipeline uh, has found uh, so far in different areas uh, and, and conclude with uh, what are the current, current and future plans for it. Um, I know I'm, I'm a bit preaching to the choir here, but um, when I talk to non-classicists, uh, I always want to start from uh, emphasizing how classics is actually a great domain uh, to be working with, uh, in, for, the, for information extraction. Um, in fact, most of information extraction research tend to focus on um, other domains and areas, for example, uh, news or social media, uh, definitely not on classics. Uh, but what classics has to offer um, its publications with a very high uh, information density. And by information density, I mean lots of references um, to other things that are important when we study classics. We have references uh, to text that can be canonical, that can be fragmentary, uh, inscriptions uh, and papyri. We have references to, uh, of course, not always, but museum objects uh, such as coins, uh, names of people, names of places. Um, the focus of, of this talk will not be on all of this, these things, but especially on the references to canonical authors, um, Greek and Latin uh, classical authors. And I should also say up front that uh, there will be not much neo-Latin, but a little bit of it, this I, I can still promise you. Um, so all these bits of information that I've just shown in the previous slide um, is not that as uh, scholars we have never leveraged them. I mean, uh, they are all uh, traditionally, at least for the books, not really for general articles, but they are indexed um, in various types of, of indices uh, of printed publications, um, index locorum, index nominum, and, in, uh, and so on. Um, and, and they provide, and they're extremely useful because they provide uh, an access point to where a given place, uh, text, or, or, uh, or person is uh, discussed in a text. Um, and I think right now uh, we have all the technology uh, that can support the automatic or, and the semi-automatic uh, creation of these indexes. And an index and, and a graph are actually two different types of looking at the same information, of representing and making usable and accessible the same information. Essentially, the fact that these entities, uh, texts, uh, people, places, and so on, they're mentioned in a text and how we can access them. Um, we, with printed indexes so far, this information has been buried into PDFs or, or printed books. And now I believe the technology is there to actually um, extract it and use it to make uh, our publications uh, more accessible. Uh, more easy to discover uh, and more also interlinked between them. Um, the talk would, would be a, a lot about the what can we do uh, with NLP tools that enable uh, the content enrichment um, to, to enhance uh, digitized publications with bits of, of such information, as I said already, entities, references, and so on. Um, and this enrichment can actually be beneficial to various players involved. You have the digital libraries who want the users to find the things that are uh, relevant for them and also want the readers to have a richer experience also in terms of retrieval and discovery. Then you have scholars who are interested in finding uh, things to, to answer specific uh, questions. And in this sense, references can be a very useful access point for them 
to find publications that are relevant for their research, especially when they're, when, when they're writing, with, uh, working on, on text. Um, and then readers also want to have better access to digital contents, contents to read, uh, browse links, and, and uh, better interfaces uh, that provide uh, uh, um, an advanced user experience. And this uh, one thing, one way of thinking about it is if we use these uh, NLP technologies, for example, to uh, extract the citations and create links to the full text, that can be extremely useful for uh, the readers. Um, but this uh, this whole making information more making publications more easier to access and to discover is not just a nice to have it's something that is actually i believe a quite an urgent uh, issue and to realize uh, the urgency of the issue i recommend you reading uh, this uh, nice blog post by by peter gainsford who did an analysis of the type of citations found in papers from fields other than classics like astronomy that deal with classics matters. And what he found out is that a very low percentages of the cited publications are from, uh, from classics. Um, that seems to indicate essentially that the literature uh, gets ignored. So the, the way he puts it is when non-classicists write about Homer, it seems they're allergic to reading any actual research on Homer and this can be a problem. So he makes two hypotheses about this. One is that Homeric research is vast and difficult to get grip with it, but he doesn't actually believe in this hypothesis. And the second hypothesis um, is that it's actually uh, existing research is invisible to them because there is a very little overlap between bibliographic databases that cover the natural sciences and the bibliographic databases that cover Homer on other topics uh, in the antiquity. So he goes on and actually uh, continues with an example of finding how difficult it is to find information about uh, relevant for, for classical literature in Google Scholar. A and he concludes writing, basically, unless Google Scholar decides to improve its algorithms, you can expect to see more scientific papers on Homer written by people who have done no research on Homer. So it's a bit extreme, uh, but I think this points um, at the fact that uh, in the humanities, uh, we do need citation indexes to cope with a large amount of, informa of uh, publications that we have. Uh, at the same time, we need information indexes that are um, fit for the humanities. And I think that an information in the, uh, a citation index should actually provide an index, not only the references to other secondary literature, but also the references to the primary sources. Um, this doesn't exist uh, yet for the whole humanities. Uh, in, the, in the past couple of years, um, I've worked uh, with my colleague Giovanni Colavizza uh, and we tried to do we tried to do uh, a prototype of a citation index, not for the whole humanities, for the historians, for the historians of the history of Venice, uh, where it, we also index uh, index uh, references to uh, canonical uh, to archival documents. Uh, sorry, um, and here I also put the reference to a paper if you're interested to know more. So this is a bit the, the bigger picture into which the research uh, fits. Uh, if we are able to extract these canonical references, then we can have citation indexes that actually make use of them. Um, a few words about the technology. Uh, so first of all, um, how did I model uh, this problem of extracting references? Uh, so here you have um, some examples, a citation of the Georgica, one of uh, Pliny's uh, natural history. Um, the, the extraction of these references is modeled as, um, first of all, as a problem of recognizing entities and disambiguating them and finding relations between them. And it's a three-step process. So the first uh, step, it's really about finding uh, citation components. For example, we find the scope of the citation and the title of the cited uh, word. And the second step, it's about relating these uh, components together to form references because it's always often the case that you have in a more discursive style um, you know an indication of the work you're citing uh, you cite one scope then you continue talking then you have another one so you need to put them back together and create relations between these components and then finally uh, what you want to do to enable the indexing is to be able to assign to each reference uh, a unique identifier um, the type 
of um, unique identifiers that I'd be using in the project are uh, CTS URNs. I will not go too much into detail, but if you look here at the syntax of a CTS URN, uh, you see there, there are identifiers for um, the author and, and the work, um, as well as for the passage that is being cited. And of course, this hints already at a problem of applying these technologies to neolithic studies that, um, as far as I'm aware, CTS URNs are not yet widely uh, adopted for, uh, for neolithic authors, and this opens a problem of how this pipeline can be compatible uh, to uh, the neoclassical uh, literature. Um, this pipeline it's implemented um, has been implemented uh, as an open source software. Uh, it's essentially made of um, four components. So the first component uh, goes into the text, extract the, uh, the entities and the relations between them and forms citations. Uh, the, second, um, the second component, the matcher, uh, tries to look, uh, to look up these references into uh, a database of uh, classical authors and works that contains also titles in different languages and the most common abbreviations and tries to see how to, um, uh, how to link them with this database. Uh, and then the, 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 final, uh, the final component uh, transforms some notations that are understandable for the human beings, but not for the machine into something that is actually um, machine actionable. And a good example of, of this are different ways of expressing the scope of a citation. You can have, for example, um, in different languages, F to indicate I cite uh, line 10, but also line 11. Then you have some expressions that you cannot translate into uh, a regular expression. Um, and so this is the job of the citation parser. Um, that's enough for, for the technology. I wanted to point out some limitations. Uh, the accuracy of extracting this information still, over, still offers margins for improvement. Uh, I'm, I've limited myself for the time being uh, and, and up until now to canonical references, but as I mentioned before, there are many other um, types of, of references to papyri, inscriptions, uh, museum objects that could be captured and that would be interesting to capture. Um, and also that the current implementation starts to be a, a bit old, uh, also because the NLP research has been go has, has underwent some uh, uh, so, so the deep neural network revolution in, in, in the last uh, five, seven years. So uh, it was difficult to, to keep it up to date with the state of the art uh, in, uh, in machine learning and NLP especially. Um, I wanted to go now, uh, yeah, here also a link to, to a paper that if you're interested, talks more about the technology. I wanted now to, uh, to show you some applications of this pipeline. Uh, the, first of, the, the first one has to do uh, with uh, the problem of information retrieval. So how can we actually use uh, this technology that extracts references from corpora of text to better, to better, access, uh, to better access these texts? And, and journal articles, those found in JSTOR, are a typical type of publication for which actually you don't have uh, indexes locorum. Uh, so it will be very, extremely useful to have an automatic way or indexing them. So I worked with a, with a JSON corpus. Here on the right, you have some statistics. So it's quite, uh, quite a large corpus. Um, also, if you look at the number of articles, but especially number of tokens in them, uh, and you have some details about the number of references and mentions that were extracted from this corpus. Um, I wanted to say two, two words of caution about the corpus itself. The first one is that these numbers refer to a dump of 2013. So now there is a gap of almost 10 years and you will find many more articles belonging to classics. And the second, um, the, the, the second remark concerns uh, the, the distribution of languages. So working with JSON data, it's, uh, it's very handy because they provide a good support for researchers who want to do research on, the, on that data. And they essentially provide you a dump that is ready to be processed. We lack of similar resources for other languages. So the, the result you get is a picture where English has a 75% of the, of the articles, which actually does not reflect um, the, the, the share that national languages gets in classical philology. And of course, we will need to have 
corpora in German, Italian, uh, French, uh, and other languages that are most re uh, more readily uh, accessible for, for mining. Uh, so I run all the JSO uh, classical uh, related articles through the pipeline, um, which essentially goes from the pure plain text, does some pre-processing, extracts components, the relations, tries to link them to a knowledge base of uh, authors and works, and finally can give you different types of annotated outputs, which mostly consist of the same text enriched with uh, CTS URNs. Um, or, then there was the problem of uh, once you extract all these references, how do we actually uh, make use of them to enable uh, better ways of accessing uh, uh, these articles? So there wasn't at the time uh, the, the resources to build a, a full-fledged uh, citation indexes, index based on this data. So we did, um, in collaboration with the JSON Labs, a, a small prototype that wants to showcase for one single uh, text for, for uh, Virgil's NA, uh, how it could look like uh, to be able to access the papers in JSTOR through information that has been extracted. And uh, in this prototype that you can try uh, online, uh, we brought together two types of information. One are the references that I extracted, and the other type are the quotations that come from, um, actually from the team at JSTOR, and they did some text reviews on their corpus and found all the quotations uh, to, uh, to DNA. So we, we brought these two types of, of data together. And what this gives, it's, a, it's an interface um, where we try to experiment with different uh, type of reading. Uh, so we you have some distant reading uh, in the form of the heat map that you find on the left-hand side that gives you an idea of uh, how many uh, articles are citing or quoting uh, DNA, uh, and we divided you know, books into chunks uh, to be able to do this kind of heat map. The darker the color, the higher the number of references. Um, and this guides the navigation. Um, this can guide the navigation, but can, the, the navigation can also be guided by uh, the, uh, the actual text of the ending. So you can select a passage, uh, see what are uh, the, the references and quotations extracted, but you could also uh, be driven by uh, this heat map and explore uh, some areas of the text that have received more citations than, than others. Um, so information retrieval as one application. Uh, the other application, uh, it's also uh, scholarly publishing. So in this pipeline, especially could be useful in cases where, uh, so as, as we know, as you all know, I think uh, when you do a monograph uh, or an edited volume, uh, the process of doing uh, an index, especially an, an index locorum, it's extremely uh, demanding in terms of time. Uh, and currently, the way, the way that publishers work, it's mostly uh, relying on the work of uh, editors and authors to, cre to create these this indices. Of course, this can work in some cases, but there are cases where uh, publications have they are so, so big and also with so many references that this uh, manual uh, way of creating indices can become a problem. Uh, and this led, uh, led me to collaborate uh, with a research group at the University of Rostock, uh, more precisely, Christiane Reitz and Simone Finkman, and also the publisher of the Greuter. So they were working on uh, a large publication of um, structures uh, in epic poetry. Uh, a publication that will cover uh, from Homer to late antiquity to neolithic literature, so a really wide, uh, a really wide uh, diachronic uh, spectrum, and it, it's a huge publication. It's in four volumes, 50, 60 contributing authors, uh, more than 70 chapters, and almost 3,000 pages. So there was a, the challenge of creating an index locorum for that. Uh, and I wrote a bit about this real, really adventure and experiment. And I wanted to share a bit with you um, some of, of, of the insights and also what we did. Uh, so here is an example of a very uh, dense paragraph where you have you know, references to the Odyssey and actually quite a lot of them uh, in, a, in, a, in a single paragraph. Uh, it, not all chapters are like this. Uh, we go from the minimum 
uh, presence of references of a chapter that has only three to the maximum that has a thousand. But at least, let's say, half of the chapters have at least 260 canonical references, which is quite a lot. And we ended up extracting 20,000 references from all these uh, 67, 67 chapters. And volume three uh, actually has two contributions on, uh, on Neo-Latin. Um, so the, uh, how was the workflow that, that we, we tried to have? First of all, I have to be fair with you. We didn't apply this semi-automatic workflow for all the indexes. The only index that was done this way was the index locorum, which is also the one of the largest with 87 pages. Uh, the index fragmentorum was partly uh, supported by this uh, work uh, pipeline, but not entirely. And the index nominum and index serum, they were done uh, manually, but in the future, of course, it would be nice to try to automatize also this type of indexes. Um, The, um, especially focusing on the index, index locorum, uh, the system was trained using a small part of the, uh, of the chapters, those that were ready first. So we had four chapters ready to go, uh, and we used them to train the system. Uh, and then the rest of the workflow was uh, semi-automatic in the sense that there would be an automatic extraction verified by a team of graduate and postgraduate students manually checking uh, the, the accuracy of, of the set of references, because of course, when doing uh, um, an index locorum or publication, you want to be thorough and as precise, as accurate as humanly possible. Um, also a word about the annotation platform that we use uh, to work with the students. Of course, this pipeline, it's quite, um, is not yet fully streamlined. So there was a problem of how to teach the students to do the, the corrections. So we had to put in, pl uh, in place a system that was relatively easy. Uh, and Inception was great for that because it, it has a very nice connection with the underlying database with classical authors and works. So essentially, students can easily uh, fix the mistakes and link the references to the right uh, text that, that was cited. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, so the there was two things that came out of this uh, collaboration. So one was the actual index that was printed uh, in, in PDFs and the byproduct, so to say, was a, a compendium. So it's a database that makes uh, available uh, all the contents of, of the publication that contains some citations and provides multiple indexes um, to, to assess this information. So you can, for example, uh, select by uh, filter all the chapters, all the paragraphs by cited work and you will find in there if you want to go and try also for example Basilio da Parma or other um, Neo-Latin authors with which I'm not very familiar. Uh, so in this interface we experimented with actually turning indexes into uh, an interface that is dynamic and allows for uh, a more dynamic exploration of these materials. Um, the workflow I will not hide it from you, was, uh, was quite complicated. It was the first application of this pipeline in a, in a context of real world publishing. And there were two main challenges. One was of course, uh, the timeline because there were constraints. For example, uh, the manual correction by the students could start only as soon as the final manuscripts were uh, finalized, meaning uh, quite late in the process and also, to do the index log quorum, you still, for, for the printed version, you still need to have access uh, to the final uh, pagination of, of these contributions. And the final pagination was from uh, the PDF that was used to print the volumes. Uh, so you have quite a complicated workflow uh, involving several types of, of formats as well, because there were the authors working in Word, then the uh, handing, handing in the, the final manuscripts uh, and then having two separate uh, processes, the typesetting done in LaTeX with the PDF at, as an end result, and the indexing that I was doing with the question with the student based on plain text and JSON. So at some point, in order to find back the, the, uh, the pagination from the PDF, there was some quite tricky sentence alignment to do. Uh, 
that made at the end possible to produce uh, in this semi-automatic fashion, fashion this um, index local rule. Uh, so to the best of my knowledge was the first uh, attempt to do uh, to create an index for a real public index local room for a real publication in this way. Uh, some lessons learned. I think the experiment was worth because of the extent of the publication and the number of citations it contains, about 20,000 that we indexed. Uh, so it would have been definitely more time consuming to do that manually. Yet I think the investment of time and resources was a bit disproportionate if it's for a single publication. But of course, if we imagine this process more streamlined and applied uh, by publishers or on a larger scale, of course, uh, it could be worth the investment. Uh, there is no time, no time, I think, to uh, to talk about the, the last application on, on reception studies, uh, even because here I will have the risk of uh, making details and, and losing time. I just wanted to give an outlook of uh, what is next uh, for this work. Um, as I said already, uh, there needs to be a technological update, especially with regards to uh, machine learning models. So the, for example, for the extraction of the references, I was using what at the time was uh, the state of the art uh, for uh, entity recognition, which are um, a type of machine learning model called uh, um, conditional random fields. Now, in seven years, the field has evolved a lot. Now there are all the uh, deep learning based architecture with powerful language models that can be used. So there is a need uh, in there to, to update the technology stake. Uh, so to say, um, also, I would like to, to use this pipeline in the context of my new research project that focuses on the history of uh, commentaries, taking the commentaries to the Ajax as a use case. And their uh, commentaries are also extremely rich uh, and dense in terms of, of references they contain. So it will be uh, very fun to, to apply uh, the pipeline there and, and hopefully also to extend the number of entities that we are able to capture. Um, of course, not only canonical references, we would like to have also uh, fragments, papyri, references to mythological names, uh, ancient places, uh, as many things as possible. Uh, we are also, we want to focus on uh, publishing some of the annotated data we have, and also the guidelines that guided this annotation uh, openly and also in a, with a bit of documentation to make it reusable. Um, and also there is in, in the agenda to continue the, the collaboration with scholarly publishers uh, in order to see whether this technology can be uh, more streamlined in the future uh, to improve the way in which uh, these indexes are, are created, created and also how this index information is actually published uh, on the web and, and used to make uh, publications more easily accessible. Many thanks for your attention. And if you have any, any questions, I'm very much looking forward to the discussion.